Kresh. Mrs. Kresh is our director of Korea at Tal Academy. She has developed a Hebrew reading curricula and much Hebrew reading curricula and games and beautiful, beautiful materials and trained professionals in schools nationwide. Mrs. Kresh has lectured at Toro Misora, Yachad, and COJDS, served as an associate professor at Toro Graduate School, and was the Hebrew reading supervisor at the Hebrew Academy of Long Beach before coming here to talk. struggles that a dyslexic child has when they're learning how to read. About a year ago, before the howl began, I met with a prospective student, a very charming boy, warm, intelligent, and I gave him a Korea test, and I want to share some parts of the test with you. We started with part one, testing letters in isolation, and he made five errors. Not terrible. And we moved on to Nakudos, and he consistently got four out of ten of the Nakudos incorrect. A fifth one he figured out halfway through the test. We moved on to single syllables with one letter and one Nakuda. He made a little, 11 out of four. That is significant. That's a lot for a basic skill. But it was interesting because when I looked at the letters that he got wrong, they were not the letters that he got wrong in part one. When I looked at the Nakudos he got wrong, they were all over the place. They weren't necessarily the ones he got wrong. So I realized he's not taking his knowledge of letters and vowels and using that to read syllables. He's just looking at each syllable and reading it by sight. We move on to the next section of the test. Still single syllables. One letter, two letters and one vowel, os and kudos. He made 13 errors and two self-corrections. That's a lot, but the way this test works, you keep on testing until they reach a certain amount of errors or time past a certain time limit, and he still wasn't on that threshold because we want to get as much information as we can. And I was glad I moved on to the next section because it showed me that he can read some words. He made more than 17 errors. I wrote on the comment section that I was only able to click on 17 errors. Because in the beginning he read carefully and slowly, and then by the end he was just making so many errors I couldn't click on it quickly enough. So he definitely made more than 17 errors and it was time to stop the test. <clears throat> but if you look at this section, there were some words he read perfectly. So in his mind, he knows how to read words. In preparation for the beginning of the year at Tal, I spoke to his Korean teacher and I asked him to first work on the letters he's struggling with, move on to the Nakudos to make sure he knows them inside out, and then when teaching single syllables, don't let him read it by sight. That's a danger. Make sure he sounds out the syllables. He reads it as b, e, b, m, a, m. But you can imagine what this boy felt like. He had to leave the school where he had so many friends, go to this new school that nobody ever heard of. And obviously, they think he's not smart here. They make him do babyish stuff. They don't even let him read those short words. Every time he tries to read it, they say, ah, three steps, mm, a, may. And he was resistant. The Korean teacher shared that with me. And I had the luxury of working with every student once a week. So I said, they need to have a conversation. The next time I met with him, I said, you know, you remember I met with you before you came to the Katal, so I know you know how to read words. Why do you think I'm making you go to these short syllables and sound them out? I told you, he's a really smart boy. He had a great answer. I was shocked. He said, well, I remember when you gave me that test before I came to Tal, you explained to me that, you know, I'm, you're testing me on the olive phase, and you're sure I know so many of the olive phase, but you want to be really thorough. And nobody's perfect at everything, so you want to get all the information you can about me. So maybe you just want to be very thorough. You want to first make sure I know the letters well. But that is fantastic, and you're right. There's another reason. When you're a really mature boy, 
I bet if I explain it to you, you're going to get it. Do you know what a scientist is? Yeah, they study the world. He said, that's right. And one of the things in the world they study is the human body. How does our heart work? How do our eyes work? How does the brain work? What part of our brain helps us to talk? What part of our brain helps us to walk? And you know that recently, scientists became interested in what part of our brain do we use when we read? And they did these amazing tests. It's called an MRI. They can put you into a machine and they can take pictures of your brain. But the machine that they use for this study is called an fMRI, a functional MRI. Because while the participants were in the MRI, they were doing reading activities. And they just tested 34,000 uh, participants only in the United States. And they did this test in different countries around the world, different languages, and they had the same results. They divided the participants into two sections. One section was the skilled readers, those who did really well at the reading test. And the other section was the non-skilled readers, those who didn't read that well. And they put them into the MRI machine. They had them do some reading activities. And they noticed that when we read, we don't just use one part of our brain. We actually use a few parts, but then they saw something really interesting. There's one section that we use that only the good readers were using. And not such good readers use it a little bit, but not enough. They said, this is so interesting. Good readers and not such good readers use different parts of their brain. Do you know what section that was? That was the part that sounds words out. I just see this boy's mouth drop open. So they said, hmm, how about if we take some of these participants and we give them lots of practice sounding short words out and getting longer and just sounding out words. Are they going to become better readers? They did that. They gave them reading tests. They became better readers. So they said, hmm, let's put them into that MRI machine and see what happens. They couldn't believe that because new pathways were created in their brain. New parts of their brain started to be work parts that didn't work before. So here at Tal, we don't just want to teach you how to read. We want you to be the very best reader you can be. So we want to give you special exercises. I know you know how to read short words, and don't worry, we'll move on to long words. But I need to give you the special exercises to force you to use that part of that brain, your brain, so you can be the very best reader. This boy was on my team. <laughs> We sat down and we read. And once in a while, he forgot to read in three steps, as he did previously. But previously, when he would grudgingly do it because I told him to, now he would turn to me and smile like, yeah, we forgot. Now, I want to expand on the science of reading for this audience, because the truth is that as educators, the science of reading could seem counterintuitive. When you look at beginning readers, and we see a skilled reader reading a sentence for the first time. And she says, the cat jumped over the log. And then you see the non-skilled reader saying, the k. It looks like it's the non-skilled reader who's trying to sound out the words. In fact, a podcast came out recently by American public media called Sold the Story. And it talks about how American educators were sold a story. We've been told for the past 30 years to ignore the science, to believe what we see with our eyes, that skilled readers don't really sound that words, and to teach students to use phonics as a last resort. But the test results showed that test scores across our country had been declining. In 2021, 60% of fourth graders were not proficient readers. Um, a few years ago, I worked with a boy, and before working with him, I called his rabbi. I told him I'm going to be working with your student, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be tutoring him in Korea. Is there anything specific you want me to work on? And he said, please teach him to dive in. It's so sad. He, I 
can't even ask him to dive because he can't do it. And I said, I, we could try to work on that. What field do you want me to start with? And he said, can you start with Shema? And I said, sure. And a few weeks later, he happened to have been speaking to the Rebbe, and he said, this is crash. How's it happening going? And I said, Baruch Hashem. When I started working with him, he knew Shema and Baruch Hashem perfectly. But by now, we worked on the first two lines of Ahafta, and he's reading it pretty fluently. He says, two lines of Ahafta? There's a whole sitter that we have to cover. And I said, yeah, but you know, I only see him twice a week, and we don't work on that for the full session. And we work on one word at a time. Every word is, is a task. He has to sound it out, learn the rules, and it takes time for him to become fluent. And he said, well, why don't you just teach it to him by sight? You say the ahafta, he says the ahafta. The other boys in the class are not sounding out the words. <laughs> and, and that's the way it seems. So why does it look like skilled readers are not sounding out words and like non-skilled readers are? Why does it look different? And the truth is that the other boys in the class aren't sounding out the words. Do you know why? Because they sounded it out enough times that it became a sight word. But it became a very special type of sight word. It became a sight word that's a sequence of phonemes. And it's mapped on their brain that way, and it's a permanent memory that will not get lost unless there's brain injury. But if the way they memorize it is by just looking at the word and trying to remember it, that's a very temporary memory. Here's the catch. Some children only need to sound out the word once or a few times, sight word. And some children, like the one I was with, <coughs> have to sound out again and again and again. There was another scientist named Keith Rayner, another type of, of research by a scientist named Keith Rayner. Very, very interesting. He did something called eye tracking studies, comparing how skilled readers use their eyes when they read, they read to non-skilled readers. What he found was that even though skilled readers are reading, looks like they're reading by sight, they're reading quickly, automatically, their eyes are processing every single letter, every single vowel. If you took the word said and you did S-A-E-D, they can pick it up in a second. But a non-skilled reader, well, they'll look at the context, please. I'd like you to listen to one minute of the Soul of the Story podcast that talks about this study because I found it really this was the 1970s and 1980s. Scientists all over the world were getting interested in reading. They had new techniques and tools to study how people read. And they started testing out very. Oh, one second. Let's go back. This was the 1970s and 1980s. Scientists all over the world were getting interested in reading. They had new techniques and tools to study how people read, things like brain scans and eye tracking technology. And they started testing out various ideas and theories. Like the idea that skilled readers use the letters and words in an incidental way, that they just skim the letters to confirm they're getting the words right. That's what Marie Clay believed. So did many other prominent academics. But was it true? There was a scholar named Keith Reader who developed eye tracking technology. 
This is James Kim, a professor at Harvard who has written about the history of reading research. And what eye tracking technology allows us to do is it allows us to see what the human eye does when it reads text. And what Keith Rayer's study showed is that good readers process virtually every letter in every word as they read. They didn't skip, they didn't look at words, and that finding was replicated over and over again. Eye tracking studies show that good readers rely on the letters to know what the words say. Another part of the human theory scientists started testing out is whether readers can use meaning and context to accurately identify words. If you cover the word with a sticky note, can you guess what it is? The answer is you can try, but you'll be wrong a lot of the time. Experiments showed that even a well-educated, skilled reader could predict only about one in four words using contextual clues. Other studies showed that it was less skilled readers who were more dependent on context for word recognition. Skilled readers were able to recognize words without relying on context at all. They could read isolated words instantly and accurately. It turns out that skilled word reading is not a detective game. It's not a game of 20 questions like Mari Clayton. Okay. Um, and, and I found this very interesting because if a student who's reading vocabulary that they're familiar with, English reading, there's just a one in four chance that they're going to guess at the correct word. What about Hebrew reading? It's just not a good idea to try and teach them this site. There's another reason why skilled readers seem to be reading without sounding out the words. That's because 40% of children do not need to learn phonics. It comes naturally. So when they're reading the cat, they're thinking cat, but it almost it doesn't look like they're sounding out the words because it comes so naturally to them. But 60% of our students, and this is very important for mainstream schools to be aware of, 60% of children need direct and explicit phonics instruction or they will not know how to read. Within that 60%, 15 to 20% need a lot of direct instruction. That's a dyslexic child. They need those skills broken into micro skills and those micro skills <coughs> broken into sub steps. The example that I like to give is a recipe. Some people go to a wedding and they taste this delicious new salad and they say, that salad is so good, I've got to make it. They go to the grocery, they buy some ingredients, they come home, they make the salad. They put the, that special herb in, some fresh lemon juice, they make the salad. Do they use a recipe? Yes. They didn't need to look at a recipe, but there was attention to detail. There was the right amount of every single ingredient. And then, most of us need a recipe. And we can be pretty decent cooks if we have a recipe. And then there are some people who, they need the recipe broken down. They might need to watch a video. They might need to begin with simpler recipes. But imagine taking somebody who needs a recipe and you say, you're sitting here with these teaspoons and tablespoons and this cart. Come on, have fun, be creative. Pour some salt, you can do it. They might look like great chefs of the kitchen, but I don't want to taste that salad. <laughs> and it's not fair to them. You're depriving them of the recipe. Our children can learn how to read every single one of them. Almost every child can learn how to read. They just need to be taught in the way that they can learn. So the student that I spoke to you about at first, we gave him the recipe. We directly taught him how to sound out words, syllables. We taught him how to read words one part at a time in an organized way. We taught him about silent letters and how to apply that to words. We even touched upon some shibaris. And a few months into the school year, we gave him the next section of the test, the one after the section where we really, really had to stop testing. This is one of those moments where you just, it makes those last few months so, so worth it. I just sat there and I listened to him. And he finished. I couldn't believe it. And I said, do you see me? He's like, yeah. I said, really, where am I? He said, you're sitting in a chair? I am flying in the clouds. I am 
so proud of you. Now, a prerequisite for learning how to sound out words is phonemic awareness. The auditory skill of hearing how those sounds come together to create words. There's a book written by David Kilpatrick, A Hook for Reading Success, that talks about how important phonemic awareness is as a pre-reading skill and guides teachers and gives them different activities that they can do with their students. Dr. Kilpatrick spoke at a Toro Maso event a number of years ago, and I've heard from countless yeshivos that they implemented phonemic awareness into their career program after listening to him. So phonemic awareness is extremely important, but I'd like to tell you a story about a student that I worked with that was part of that 15-20%. She didn't just need phonemic awareness skills, she needed to learn the micro skills. This girl's mother reached out to me when she was in pre-1A, she was five years old, and she told me that they spent last year learning the letters of the olive phase, then they relearned it in pre-1A, and she still didn't pick up on it. This mother was concerned, and I said, you know what, I don't have time to work with her, but I have someone fantastic, someone who works for me in the health Priya uh, room, and I recommended someone, and it was nice, because I used to hear from this teacher how well she's doing, and she said this girl feels so good about herself. My parents are so happy, and, and she told me we had a party, because she finished the olive phase. Then she started telling me, I don't know, I don't know, maybe she's just, we're not getting along so well, she just cries, she refuses to come, she doesn't want to learn anything new. And when I teach her, when I want to review the olive phase, she's happy to do that. But when we get to reading, she just refuses to do it. Until this teacher said, you know what, maybe it's time for a new teacher, another perspective. And she recommended somebody else. This other person was a very dedicated, caring teacher. She called me in the beginning of the summer. She said, Rachi, you are putting this girl into your schedule. She's only five years old. She's burnt out. She cries. She refuses to come. Her parents will do anything to help her. Please just try. And so I put her into my schedule. And she came to my office at the beginning of the summer. She looked so scared. She's trying not to cry. I knew my job for today is just to make this little girl feel safe. Try to learn as much as I can about her. I said, come in. Do you want to see our special prizes? We're going to play a game. Now, the way the game worked is that there's a game on one side and words on the other side. But at first, I didn't make her play. I tried to make her win. And you see that tense body relaxing a little bit. She starts smiling a little bit. And I say, you know, do you mind just telling me either the sound of the letter or the sound of the Nakuda? She had no problem with that. After I saw her relaxing even more, I said, when we play, do you think you could try to read the words? You can read it any way you want. You could say sha, ah, sha. You could just say sha. And in this room, Mistakes are not a problem. I make the most mistakes though. So that's my, she really wanted to please me. So the new teacher would be nice to her. So she looked at the card and I saw her whisper to herself. Blah. She looked at it really carefully because she didn't want to get it wrong. Blah. E. V. Great job! She read a lot of words. She got some of them right, some of them wrong. But what I noticed is that most of her errors were not that she said the letter wrong or that she said the Nakuda wrong. She was missing a phonemic awareness skill. She did not hear that her thing says hey. And this poor girl, because she's a girl who's hard on herself, she wants to do really well. And she worked so hard to think of that letter sound that she got it right. And she worked so hard to think of the Nakuda sound. And then when she told it to the teacher, the teacher said, good try, try again. I tried my very best. I want to mention that I spoke to the teacher before working with her, and her teacher told me that they work on phonemic awareness skills, which is wonderful. They work on rhyming, they work on syllable division. They don't work on the skill that she needed at this point of her Kriya reading, which is to hear how one consonant and one vowel blends. And it's not a skill that's taught at the beginning of English reading. And some children who are just exposed to different phonemic awareness 
activities will pick that up on their own. But she needed the micro skills. And the Korean teacher that worked with her beforehand worked on this. But not enough and not until. This was a very hard thing for her. It took us a long, long time to get her over this bump in the road. But once she got there, everything else was much easier. Not easy, but much easier. Just to give you an idea of some of the sub-steps within this micro skill that we had to work on. We started with one huda, chibrek, because children can hear a long vowel better than a short vowel. Real pictures, clapping it out so they could hear the rhythm. B, E, D, K, E, K. A few sub-steps down the road. Let's see if you can Still working on the Nakuta Chirik, but now we're doing nonsense syllables and no pictures. Let's see if you can blend those. Can I try the video or? I'm going to try. Let's discuss some of the demands. And I can't talk about all of them because I know it's late at night, we all want to go to sleep. Some of the demands that Korea puts on our children. And keep in mind that these demands can go anywhere from easy or take some effort for most children, but for a dyslexic child, most of, or all of these demands are extremely challenging. First, they need the auditory memory of each phoneme, but it's not enough to remember it. You've got to remember it in a second. And for Hebrew reading, it's a lot more complicated because it's not enough to remember that this is a fay. It's a fay, but it's not a pay because there's no partial credit. You thought about everything, but you got it close. Not enough. It's wrong. The kudos that all look so alike. Now I need to take phonemic awareness, which is not so, doesn't come so naturally to me, to blend those phonemes into syllables, not enough. Now process those individual syllables to form organized words. So now I thought really hard and I got the word kanav, and I realized it's a pay, not a fei, pa, nav, and out of my mouth came the word banav. I need to make sure that my mouth, motor planning, is forming the sounds that I have in my brain. Oh, and let's not forget, application of silent letter on Shabbat rules says that you're in the middle of the word, does it make a sound? It's like asking an overweight child who's not very coordinated to jump. Most kids say, yay, I love to jump, but he's, oh. okay, now while you jump, clap your hands. And now turn around in a circle. Why do you climb that hill while you're at it? <laughs> it's hard. Some of the red flags. Children with dyslexia will have, probably have a difficult time Remembering sounds at a young age, remembering the sounds of the letters. One sign is not enough to diagnose a child with dyslexia, but if you see it accumulating, that's when you should start thinking about it. Phonemic awareness difficulties, which Dr. Safer mentioned, a hard time with rhyming, beginning sounds, syllable division. How many times do you hear a teacher say, she could read, she read a page perfectly to me yesterday. If she tries, she's not, she could do it. I could also climb mountains and clap my hands and turn around in circles when I try. But I can't do it for a few hours every day consistently. Because for a dyslexic child, it's hard. And research shows that when we're under pressure, our abilities are heightened, but we can't be under pressure constantly. It takes too much thought and never reaches fluency. Every skill, every micro skill, they need the time to master it. One step backwards and one step forward, for some of these children, they're compensating. And it works for a while, and they gave that step back forward, and then they fall back because it doesn't work anymore. Letter swaps. I focused on the letters, I blended them, but then I, they came out of the wrong order. 
wrong. Careless errors. You know the letter Gimel. Why'd you leave that out? Because I was thinking about that double Shabbat rule in the word. This is our last slide. <laughs> Talking about challenges. Let's see if it's going to work. I have a challenge for all of you. Can you figure out the missing number? Seconds. Some of you just gave up, right? Yeah. So I'm not going to bother. Let's see. <laughs> oh, I got it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Creative thinking, right? <laughs> There's no way. Oh, no, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> Our job as parents, teachers, educators is to take our perspective and turn it around 360 degrees. To understand that child's challenge. It's not his job to try and accommodate our way of teaching. And this lecture was mostly about understanding the child. That's a big step in the right direction. You know, hopefully we'll have other lectures that talk about the, you know, how to help them. But just understanding the challenge is really, really a huge step. Thank you. Definitely two acts that are very hard to follow. And I promise you, I'm only going to speak for just a few minutes. But we just felt that we would really be remiss if in the Judaic Studies curriculum, we only felt Kriya is huge. If you can't get past that, you're stuck in so many other areas. But it's not the whole picture. So I wanted to just give a few ideas. It's certainly larger than this, but a few ideas of a um, few examples of how we see this in the larger Judaic studies curriculum. These are sort of at the beginning of Herod days. And let me give you an example when I translate this first line. And watch, I'm going to point to each word as I translate it. And watch my finger move along. And a man from the house of Levi went. Let's try this one. And his sister stood from afar. The word order, um, when children are trying to translate in Hebrew, the word order from e Hebrew to English in the, in the native language that they think is very different. And they could learn this, but we have to be conscious of that, that that's a challenge for them. Um, at other talks, we could talk about how we teach that. For today, I just really wanted, wanted to give an idea of what that's like for a child. Um, and that could happen even in one word. May our Tzachana was speaking with the Rebbe of our youngest boys, and Kaisha Slachlacha. Even in the word, from your land. Um, you're translating it, the different parts of the word are not translated in the same order that they're used to hearing. Some other common challenges in the Judaic Studies curriculum. And now this is sort of taking a lot of the themes that, that you've heard from Dr. Seifer and Mrs. Kresh and showing how that comes together. Difficulty sequencing. Sequencing the parts of a partial story. Or we're, we're, we were just talking with our language pathologists and our teachers were collaborating about the best way to talk to tell the current story. There's a main plot, there's a subplot. How do we make sure this is clear for our students? Chronological events. Avram Avinu was not at Itzias Mitzrayim. <laughs> the flow of questions and answers in a Rashi, in a Mishnah, in a Gemara. This can be taught, but we have to be aware of that and plan our lessons in a way where we can help our kids see that structure. Difficulty retelling Parsha stories. They might be able to answer different questions along the way, but may not be able to retell a full story. Or they can tell the precious story, but they can't remember the names of the word finding. They can't remember the names of any of the people in the story. Um, or they you know all of the ideas Kalios, but they have so much trouble understanding the concepts in the Chumash, in the Rash. Or they understand all of the ideas, but they have a very poor rote memory. Um, they can't remember the names of the monks, the names of the Shvatim, um, the, the dates of specific holidays, those kinds of things. Um, they have difficulty remembering new words. I had a student I was working with who I told him um, four explanations for Ki Tovu. What, what was the good that Yochavit saw in Miriam? 
He heard it once, the next day he said them all. But he couldn't remember that Yeled means boy and Ben means son. And in those sukkim that I showed you, those both words appear. So in speaking with Dr. Seifer, we came up with this, that this, this visual, this mnemonic, and once he had that, he just needed that to remind himself. And sometimes the, the, the more far out, the more absurd you put it to it, the easier it is for kids to remember it. That's a, good, a way for Ben to remember it, for him to remember that Ben was done. And once he had it, it took a little while, and he had it. He won't continually make that mistake. And he'll remember the mnemonic. I like to use this one. He parade means to separate. So when the parade comes, the crowd separates. Um, should we teach? This was a question that was asked. It's, a, it's such an important question. Should we teach language comprehension to children who are struggling with Korea? And my answer to that is once they're proficient enough to read multisyllabic words fairly fluently and accurately, even if they're still making some mistakes, we'll continue to work at the Korea but we can't hold them back. Absolutely resounding, yes. We should te teach them how to translate Sukkim. And I'm of the belief that even further than that, um, well, actually, let me give you an example to show that uh, teaching them comprehension will actually help their reading. This is a uh, Sukkim that we started with our girls' class. The Ela told us Yitzhak, these are the children of Yitzhak, Ben Avram, son of Avram, Avram, Yevrin, to Yitzhak. Then they get to the next puzzle, right? He is Hak Ben Arba'im Shana, and Yitzhak was 40 years old. They're not used to this framework that when you say how old somebody is, it's Ben Arba'im Shana, you say Ben Arba'im Shana, Ben Sheesh, Yisrael, Ben Shalosh, whatever it is. So what do you think, how do you think everybody read that word on the first day? They didn't read by Yitzhak Ben Arba'im, they read by Yitzhak Ben Abraham. Abraham. And they just read that in the Pasuk before, and they're used to the format, Yitzhak ben Abraham. But we had spent a lot of time in pre-teaching and explaining the concepts, and they understood that Yitzhak was 40 years old. Once they understood the Pasuk, that mistake didn't happen again. The Kriya got better with the understanding. Um, so they do, and, and when we do teach commission this way, then they have opportunities for repeated reading with understanding, and in fact, it helps their Korea to come together, and certainly helps with their understanding. Um, so I do believe, teach children with language-based learning disabilities, Hebrew language skills, teach them vocabulary and context, teach them grammar, even if we teach um, in this basic um, sequence, uh, um, we will be giving them a tremendous amount uh, of, of basis for understanding language. Start with simple sentences, go to paragraphs, and move to the more complex. We shouldn't sell our kids short. They could do this. Our kids are overwhelmed by the pace and the volume of what they're exposed to in the classes. But if we could cut that down, start even in small amounts, here's the key, teach in small chunks, Make sure that they master each step. You can only do three word, three new milim. Great, do three new milim this week. Next week, add three more when he's ready for that. Teach those six together, and make sure you're doing everything in context. He's using it. He's sitting in the psukim. You're using it in sentences. Do mixed pack practice. Do cumulative review. We're still doing partial games with our students that are asking them questions from um, way back to to Adam and Chava and and, and Abraham and Noah, etc. And they know it because we keep keep reviewing it with them. And this is sort of our motto over here: teach as slow as they need, but as fast as they can. Don't hold them back. Make sure that you're just at that sweet spot where where they they have that comfort level and they can go a little bit. Um, I wanted to let you know, and so I know that was sort of quick to do that, but we felt that that was important to give a well-rounded um, picture of, of the kinds of things that our children feel challenged about in secular studies, in Judaic studies, and in their home life in general. Um, we are very excited to let you be the first ones to know of our upcoming webinar series featuring our own Dr. Lydia Seifer. In March, we'll be, she'll be focusing on Hill Outgrow It When? the importance of early identification of language learning disabilities. In April, executive functions, be the boss of your brain. And in May, working memory, you're in trouble without it. So that was a lot for all of us to say. And you have been an amazing crowd. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, although the hour
hour is late, we are open if the, the other want to present one or two questions. We're, we're open to that. If everyone wants to get home to their bed. I just want to say that um, I sent the students that I used to work with to town, and I got a chance to call the mother on the way here, and she could not stop saying how I know how much he struggled and how he was so resistant about going out to work together and doing it and, and work. And when he saw the words, he was so nervous. And after being in town for the short amount of time, she said he's trying to read words that he sees and all these, and I just wanted to say I'm just so, so happy to have one thing that's really beautiful is that our kids aren't feeling anymore like I'm the different one. I'm the one who's, um, yeah, and a lot of other really great kids that, that have similar challenges and support each other. So that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. What remains the biggest challenge? Um, I mean, for, for a student with language based learning disabilities in general, um, because I really, you know, based on what Dr. Seifer was saying, it depends on each child. Who is this child? And each child has their own, their own biggest challenge. I don't know, Dr. Seifer, if you want to address that. What I would say is the, the biggest challenge is getting um, the children as early as possible so that we don't, I don't believe in let's wait and see. And as I, I said before, if we could train teachers to recognize some of these patterns of development that are simply and utterly not kosher, that we could not waste time. And let's see how it goes. The minute I hear that, let's see how it goes. To me, that's the biggest red flag. Let's give them a little time because the expectations in kindergarten and first grade are so vastly different than the expectations in fourth grade. And by the time they get there, that image that I used was deliberate of an accumulated deficit. It is a very, very challenging emotionally, intellectually, and linguistically. It's a very tough game of catch up baseball. They have to work much harder. So if we teach them the way they can learn from the get go, that we're not fixing what has been broken. So that, I would say, Dr. Zakarowitz, is the biggest issue, is educating the populace that we can identify these behaviors that are screaming at us very early on. And the story that I, I like to tell is when I was working in another yeshiva, consulting there, I was in the early in the preschool. And they were two and a half and three years, well, they were three years old in that, that group. And I remember trying to teach them, I was called Maura Liddy, because there was just too many syllables of Lydia, Maura and Lydia. So I became Maura Liddy. And um, I taught them the Maura Liddy name game. And that's how we started identifying. You ready? Maura Liddy. We danced my name. What is your name, may I ask? Just give me the first name. <laughs> your first name. Okay, watch the difference. Yeah, huh, ba. If then Bruffy gets up and goes, Bruffy! Bruffy doesn't know one syllable from him. And then if I have to teach them, I literally would put the children on my feet and do Bruffy until they learn. And I could spot who was having trouble in early phonemic awareness. You want to spot them early? Watch who can rhyme. Watch who knows the nursery rhymes. All right? That's Sam I am, that's Sam I am. I do not, I have all the examples to give any yeshiva. I do not like <laughs> green eggs and peanut butter and jelly. No, sweetie. No. All right? I look for who can rhyme. We read, I know Dr. Seuss has been having a hard time lately, but we read Dr. Seuss on purpose. We do the name game, all right. Is your belly made of jelly? I think it's very smelly. And, and see who can do that. Because I can start teaching them to do that when they're three and four. 
And those who are having trouble learning, I guarantee you, are going to have trouble learning to read. And then there are those kids who can decode every word and haven't a clue as to what those words mean. And this is all identifiable. These phonemic awareness skills that Mrs. Fesh, to which she referred, these are identifiable in very young children. They are the foundations of literacy. So the answer to your question is, what is the biggest issue? Is training teachers. The same way I train those pediatricians. Hell out, grow it? Yeah, prove it. Want me to treat your kid that way? No, we can identify these issues very early on. And that's part of the, the issue is training educators how to recognize and educate all children because they're not, as, they're not trained in ways that make them as potent as they could be. The literature is as clear as could be. It's been out there for a while. And the whole notion of the science of reading, I have to say I have such respect for Mrs. Gresham that she never mentioned she who shall not be named um, because the, the science of reading versus, oh, they'll figure it out, created generations and generations of children. And as I said earlier, I have one child who has dyslexia, who is a superb speller, and the other one went to the New York City public schools. And guess who had to teach him how to spell? The right mommy. Yeah. All right. So we can identify very, very early who is at risk. That's the biggest problem, Dr. Zagaros, is training teachers to have diagnostic eyes and ears and then to give them techniques without saying, this one is oh, she's such a pain, no matter how much time I give her, she doesn't get it. Thank you all for coming.